In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome to worship. It is good to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is good to come into the house of the Lord with praise, and so we come, giving thanks to God for meeting us and calling us here as God's people. And we say with this joy and celebration that our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Amen. It is so good to be gathered with all of you. Let us call one another to worship using the words of our psalm for the day, Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and all his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Praise the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Christ be with you. Please share a sign of his peace with one another. Beloved, today we come to confess our sins before God and before one another. This morning, for our confession of sin, we will be using a time of silence along with a refrain called a Kyrie. Kyrie eleison is a Greek phrase meaning, Lord, have mercy. And we'll invite you to sing that as we move through our prayers this morning. Loving God, we approach you with contrite hearts. Things are not as they should be. We confess our sin to you now, knowing that you are ready to forgive and your mercy is abundant. We confess our idolatry. We have put other things in your place. Oh God, hear our cry for your wholeness. We confess our use of language which belittles and dehumanizes and manipulates. We are sorry for our words that do so much damage. Forgive us. Thank you. 
We confess to you our arrogance and our selfishness. We believe we can do whatever we want, and we are not accountable to others. We seek to lead without considering how you led. Forgive us. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Amen. In a moment, we will invite you to listen and watch as the waters of baptism are poured as a reminder to us. People of God, hear the good news from the prophet Isaiah. With everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord God, your Redeemer. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Beloved, having been forgiven our sin, let us turn to Exodus chapter 20 to hear the commands which the Lord has given to us. Being marked in baptism, we remember the lives that we are invited to live in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say this law together to remember how it is we are to live. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the, land of sl- out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth below, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land the the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or a male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
at this time, not to make too hard of a right turn, but can the kids come up uh, and join me up here at the steps? How's it going, everybody? So I have um, a big, important question this week. And the big, important question is this, because I've been thinking a lot about superheroes this week. So I need to know, if you could have a superpower, any superpower, what superpower would you want? Does any, Isla. To make it rain bread? That would be an amazing superpower. That would be amazing. Yes. Silas? You want to be camouflage. You are wearing the right shirt. All right. Is there, what else? Like anybody else? What's superpower? Harper. Invisibility. All right. Any flyers? Anybody want to fly? Okay. Amy, yeah. Some flyers? Okay. That's good. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be good. Hunter and I, before service, were talking about how cool it would be to, like, do the Harry Potter thing and apparate or, like, just... Because anytime you want, you could be on the beach or skiing down a mountain or something. Like, like you could do a number of things, right? Like, you could just transport anywhere. I think that'd be fun. Um, <clears throat> well, today, we are going to talk about someone who is asked by God, what can I do for you? And there was a lot of assumed answers, right? If God came to you and said, hey, I can do anything for you, what do you think? Maybe you would want to say, oh, I want all the money, right? Or maybe you would say, well, I want all this power. I want the ability to not answer to anybody. I want the ability for my chores to just be done like that or not have any chores. Wait a minute, right? Like all of these things. But this guy, his name was Solomon, and he just said, well, I want wisdom, do you know what wisdom is? Does anybody have any idea? What's wisdom? Do you know? It's a, it's a big word. Maybe it's just a church word that we hear sometimes. Like, what's, what's wisdom? Yeah. Oh, that's a great definition, Grace. I love that. Way to go. So Grace just said, wisdom is someone that knows the way. And I think that's exactly what the Bible means. Um, when the Bible talks about wisdom, it means someone that is familiar and stays on the path that God has for them. That's what wisdom is. And it's the, it's the understanding to always do things the way that God intended them to do. Now, that's a really hard thing, as we can imagine. But Solomon, that's what he asked for. And so it's kind of like, as we read the Bible, and the Bible stories about this guy Solomon, we'll hear that there's a lot of stories about him following the way. And it almost becomes kind of like the thing that he does really well. And it's the kind of, uh, it's the kind of invitation that we as God's people are also given. So just that maybe like more important than flying or to be camouflaged or invisible or whatever else, teleportation, raining bread, right? Like being wise is kind of like a, um, a superpower that we are invited to have and share with God and um, that we may be able to live the lives that God really wants us to live, full and flourishing and for that to be um, all, for all of us and for everybody. Isn't that cool? All right. Thanks for that. We're going to pray, and then I'll dismiss you, all right? Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you are the God who wants us to be wise. And we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you help us do that by listening to the way of your Son, Jesus. Help us do that in everything we do and every word we say. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, for everybody that is up through second grade, you can go with Miss Catherine downstairs, and the rest of you can go back to your seats or color at the art table. Thanks for coming up. Let us pray. God, source of all light, by your word, you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding 
that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be opened to, the know, to know the things that, are, that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord today comes to us from the uh, Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and 3, verses 13 through 14, and then from Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 20. Here are these words from our Holy Scripture. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the thrones of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in, a place of my, in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how people whom you have chosen, uh, or, or, or I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of a people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, For who can govern this great people of yours? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I will give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has ever been before you, and no one like you shall ever arise after you. I shall also give you what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. This is the word of the Lord and from Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, I have to tell you, um, I didn't always know how many people was 111,000. I didn't always know that. But if you come to me at the corner of Stadium in Maine and Ann Arbor, I can begin to paint the picture for you. It is there that you will find uh, the big house, Michigan's football stadium, which comfortably seats 80,000, but Michigan fans do not like to be comfortable, so we squeeze 111,000 into the stadium. No, Michigan fans do not like to be comfortable whatsoever. Thank you very much. We don't want to be happy while we watch our football. We like to be in constant torment. And even like last year when a national championship is being won, we would prefer one where our coach gets suspended and a bogus NCAA investigation ensues because that's the Michigan way, to do things with great discomfort. I didn't always know how many people was 111,000. That it, because even though I had been in a stadium, 
packed full before. The first time I realized how many people, 111,000, was the first time I took my daughter to a game. And then, as a parent, when you realize you are responsible for someone else, suddenly you realize how many people is 111,000. That answer, too many, too many people. I felt panic rising as we walked through the gates. We were there early, her, uh, myself, uh, her friend, and her friend's father. And I immediately began to look around and find our seats with great hesitation. I was nervous already, and it, we hadn't even started the game, nor was, there even close, it, was it even close to being full. By the game's height, I looked around and said, how are we even gonna get out of here? I was judging escape routes and things like that, which is, of course, a fruitless endeavor. I felt like I was in over my head, even though I was having a great time being a dad, sharing something that I loved. I felt out of my depth. I felt like I needed help. How was I to be responsible for one in the midst of 111,000. Now fast forward with me about another time, last April in fact, where me and that same oldest daughter, now grown up, were in Costa Rica, in a town that I've told you about before, Los Chiles, a town of around 2,000 people, Every night, as I've shared with you before, about 14 to 20 buses with around 70 people each get off, having made their, they are migrants, having made their way through Panama and being bused through Costa Rica to the northern border with Nicaragua. And there, less than three miles from the Nicaraguan border at a bus stop, the town doubles in size each and every night. We were invited by uh, Santiago, one of our uh, 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 discipleship and mission consultant for the last few years, somebody that is known here. We were invited to go with this group, and we showed up at this bus stop. Immediately, law enforcement approached this van of majorly white people and said, what are you doing here? Could you please move your van? And then they began to hassle Santiago a bit more, saying, don't we know you? Aren't you with that soup kitchen up the road? And then there was another altercation in an argument or maybe just a passionate discussion. My Spanish is pretty bad. Ensued with a group of people, young men, arguing with Santiago about what was happening at the scene of the bus station. At the same time, at the same time as this heated argument was going on, migrants were coming off, looking in various states of disarray, tired, worn, of various ages, ill, not feeling well, hungry, some of them in very real danger. As they got off, I had that same feeling that I did in that stadium of 111,000. So I didn't know what to do. I felt out of my depth. I wanted to maybe go and talk with people and give them some kind of reassurance, but I'll tell you, Third Reformed, I felt a bit panicked. I wasn't sure that I knew what it is I should have done or and even my oldest, who was there, echoed and shared similar feelings of feeling helpless, not sure what to do. And so, as we, the group we were with began to serve a meal of rice and beans, she just got in line and started serving the beans as people made their way through the line. Sometimes, when you're feeling helpless, you just need to sling a few beans, I think. Sometimes, when we feel helpless, we have the opportunity to live into our wisest moments. Have you ever felt helpless like that? Have you ever known not what to do or how to respond? 
we get this beautiful story of Solomon, and it is caricatured for us in appropriate ways for today as it's passed down and as I learned in Sunday school that Solomon asked for wisdom. And how wonderful was that? And indeed, we should characterize it. But we shouldn't forget the context. Solomon, by most scholarship accounts, was around 20 when he became king of Israel. 20 was the age when I was arrested. So Solomon and I were making different life choices, right? Like, but so here he is. He's king of Israel, of God's own people, to numerous to count. And he is one, and he's young, and he's following in the heels of his father David. A legend, a legend. The kind of king that stabilized the kingdom of Israel after Saul. And Solomon has to come on the heels of that at 20 and try to be king? (laughs) Of course he's nervous. The context here is that Solomon is going and asking the Lord in burnt offerings after burnt offering after burnt offering for help. I don't think his prayers perhaps weren't all that articulate beyond, hey God, could you give me something, right? Like I'm, I'm struggling here. What do, you, what do you should do? Look at the words again of Solomon. He says, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, although I am only a little child. Again, by most scholarship accounts, 20. But Solomon sees himself yet as a child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of a people whom you have chosen. A great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. God, I'm out of my depth. I don't know what to do. These are your people. I need help. Have you ever felt helpless? Have you ever felt out of your depth? Have you ever not known what to do? I think Solomon did. And I also, while Solomon gives a very glowing and rosy account, I don't think that Solomon is ignorant of the recent history that preceded him, which we just kind of, uh, here at Third Reformed Church, we've been hearing and reading about some of David's greatest failures, spending time with them, but it is, of course, maybe uh, something that Solomon was aware of himself, knowing how easily A kingdom can corrupt under our feet when we don't do the wise or right or true thing. But when our temptations get the best of us, when we stumble and when we fall, Solomon's young. The temptations might feel real, and he feels out of his depth. So he asks for wisdom. And God says, indeed, granted. And then I'm going to give you long life and riches even though you didn't ask for them because you asked for wisdom. And before we go and we, and we say, oh, great, so if we do the wise and right thing, um, that means we'll get riches and, wrong, and long life. No, that's wrong. That's called prosperity gospel, and it is bad news, right? Before you fall into that kind of thinking, consider this. That rather than uh, saying an if-then... With God, if you ask for wisdom, if you do the right things, then God will reward you with long life and plenty of riches. Consider that God has given Solomon a blessing to lead the people well. And when there is a a desire for the thriving of all people, if that is our concern rather than a selfish concern of money or self-preservation, then maybe the blessings of community and of kingdom flourishing find their way to us. See, some of these passages have ancient ways of speaking. You may have noticed that as we read through our Ten Commandments. 
great things to keep in mind, but also uh, Janelle and I, when we were reading some of the explanations for the various Ten Commandments, we wanted to, to uh, give the inflection for those ourselves and maybe take the pastoral load off all of y'all from having to say some of those things because some of those things are hard, right? I will visit, you know, the punishment to the third and fourth generation on those. Well, that's not, come on, God, right? But some of this is just ways of speaking about wisdom. When the Old Testament says, I will visit on the third and fourth generation the punishment of the parents, that actually doesn't mean God is sitting there going, okay, well, the parents murdered, so that means I have to do this to the children and this to the grandchildren. That's not what that means, right? Like, we, we know that. What it means is if you live your life according to the way of murder and of, and of theft and of debauchery, if you live your lives according to that kind of rubric, you might be, not be surprised that a cycle that is destructive can repeat itself. Amen? We know about this. Cycles repeat. Patterns repeat. And we are told in the same breath that God's love continues to the thousandth generation. Always overextending and outlasting any of that kind of cycle. The love of God is greater than the cycle of brokenness that we all no. So, thank you for that aside. Let's get back to it. So, Solomon, as he's 20, feeling helpless, asks for wisdom. How good to ask for wisdom. A wise and discerning heart. Give me understanding, O oh God, of the people that I meet, that will, I will interact with. Give me understanding of the world around me. Give me understanding to walk in your ways, follow your commands, and keep your statutes. That, that is the way of wisdom. Third Reformed Church, living the way of wisdom takes practice. It takes practice and it takes effort. Solomon gets wisdom, not magically overnight. This isn't a pill that Solomon swallows. Did you notice God's response? If you walk in my ways, if you keep my statutes and my commands, then, right, if you live the life of wisdom, surprise, wisdom will follow. If you live a foolish life, foolishness will follow. Okay? If you live a wise life, if you follow the way that God has laid out to, to walk, then, then surprise, you will be wise. So what does Solomon do? Already evident in this passage, we see Solomon spending time with God, going to uh, spend time with the Lord, going to the high place, offering sacrifices. That was his way of communing with God, of giving his time to be with God. If you want a wise life, if you want to live a wise life, we've got to develop the discipline and the habit of spending time with God. We've got to spend the time. <clears throat> Paul knows this and echoes this in a post-resurrection world when Paul is dealing with a church who, that is often divided, often in conflict. Paul writes to them and says, make the most of time because the days are evil. Live as wise people, not as unwise people. Be ready. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't, uh, don't get drunk and carouse around all the time. Be ready. Follow the ways of the Lord. Encourage one another with songs and spiritual melodies. Get your hearts in tune with the way of God. Be filled with the Spirit and spend time with God. That's how wisdom works, Third Reformed Church. That's how wisdom works. Spending time with God. Following the way that God has set the world up to work. Following the life, in our case, 
the way that Jesus lived. If you ever want to know, and we're told this in the gospel, that Jesus is wisdom in the flesh, if we want to know how to live, spend time with God, be filled with the Spirit, and look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. How did Jesus live? In love, seeking wholeness of others before himself, following the law to love God and love neighbor. This is the way of Jesus, and this is the way of wisdom. Friends, <clears throat> sometimes we can feel out of our depth, helpless, like the task before us is too big and too cumbersome for us to carry. It is in those moments that I think we have an opportunity to do the wisest thing. Admit that we need help, that we don't have it all together. And then sometimes, for those of us that inhabit leadership positions, teachers, pastors, managers, people that supervise teams, Consider that sometimes the best posture of leadership is humility, of putting yourself last, of learning in a situation that you feel completely overwhelmed and out of your depth by. Consider that wisdom is slowing down and paying attention and reminding yourself that when we spend time with God, when we put that kind of humility on ourselves, that that is the way to wisdom, staying faithful when things feel overwhelming or difficult. How is God asking you to be faithful with this kind of wisdom today? Is God asking you to just admit that you need help for the first time in a long time? Maybe you are holding it together, but just barely, and you're really good at putting on a show like you've got it all together, but when you shut the door and are in your room by yourself, you quickly fall apart. Maybe you need to admit to God or to a trusted person that you need help that you're swimming in waters that feel really rough and too deep. That takes courage to do that, by the way. And I hope if that's where you are, that you find both the assurance that God longs for that kind of communion with you and that there is a bravery and a courageous spirit that it takes to admit that you need help. Maybe, Maybe you have found your way into temptation of some sort or another, and you know the path that you're on is not wise and not cultivating wise habits in your life, and you can see the destruction start to eat at the edges of your life around people that you care about, around things that you do. I want to offer you that be, in these texts are reminders of a strength in God's love and grace and character to pull you back on the right path to live a life of wholeness and wisdom that longs for your flourishing. Maybe today is simply a reminder that God longs to spend time with you, that God longs to hear from you in prayer, that God longs for you to join God, in the reading of the word, in the communion of the faithful, time with the faithful, learning, being discipled, being open to sharing your gifts and serving. Maybe you just needed that encouragement that God says, hey, I want to see more of you, that you might be on the wise path and on a life-giving path. Wherever you are, out of your depth, overwhelmed, that God has, but that, that those moments are invitations to us to live our wisest lives. 
may you continue to know God's presence in your life as you seek to live the wise way, rooted in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. So God, meet us. Give us what we stand in need of, which sometimes feels like, oh, so much. We are reminded by the psalmist, O Lord, that knowledge of you, fear of you, is the beginning of wisdom, an understanding that you are God and we are not. So we bring to you our full humanity, broken and redeemed in the name of your Son, longing for the restoration of your world by the power of your Holy Spirit. Meet your people wherever we are today and strengthen us and give us a resolve to live lives that are wise, seeking wholeness and justice. And we pray this in the strong and wise name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, one God and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We are so delighted to be gathered together in worship. All of us who are here in the sanctuary and the many who are joining us via Zoom from their homes or from places of travel, we welcome you and we pray for your blessing as you worship with us. I want to invite uh, any and all from the congregation who may be interested uh, that at 1130 we have our second service in Spanish. If you've never attended the Spanish service called El Encuentro, we hope that you will find a time when you would like to do that. Uh, there is translation available in English if Spanish is not um, your first language or one that you understand. And um, it's a great chance to meet a whole other portion of our congregation um, here at Third Reformed Church. 
wanted to let the congregation be aware for your own planning that Sunday school for all ages, our Christian Education Hour, will begin on Sunday, September 8. Um, and this includes our choir that will resume their regular practices um, and rehearsal schedule. Um, we hope you'll look forward to this. If you have questions about how you might fit into that as a volunteer or as uh, one to attend or needing to know how your family might attend those things, please reach out, call the church office, um, uh, tap a neighbor, and we'd love to help you get connected. Another way to be connected both within our congregation and in our neighborhood is on Wednesday, September 4, from 5.30 to 7.30. We will have a block party here outside. We will have great food. We'll have a big bouncy house, a chance to maybe get a little water games in, and um, lots of fun. We hope that you'll come, but we also hope that you will uh, think through your neighbors and friends and family about who might be um, uh, who might wish to join an event like that and get to know our congregation and us to get to know them as well. It's a great way to welcome new friends and, um, and uh, neighbors. If you have questions about that, check your bulletin, check the newsletter, or ask someone uh, on the church staff. We hope that you'll sign in on the fellowship pads that are at the end of each pew. This is for members and visitors. Uh, it's an opportunity, if you haven't yet uh, shared your contact information for Third Reform to be able to get to know you and include you in invitations. It's also a place where you can ask a question or reach out if you have need of prayer or talking with a pastor. So please make use of those fellowship pads. Uh, they're at the end of the pews or the link that appears on the screen for those who are worshiping remotely. If you've come today and you desire prayer, through the east door, right after the service, there will be members there ready and glad to pray with you and hear whatever it is that is on your heart. And at this time, we invite the congregation to um, bring our tithes and our offerings as part of our worship and of our giving back to God from all that he has blessed us with in Jesus' name.
Let us join our hearts together as we go to God in prayer. God, we bless your name. We give you honor and praise and thanks for who you are, and for how you have formed us, for how you are shaping us by your grace and in your strength. Make us to become like you. Help us to receive from you all that you would breathe into us for your purposes, for the proclaiming of your greatness in the world. Jesus, we bless your name for making us your own, for the gift of your life and of your life in us so that we can live for you. And we look to you, Holy Spirit, for all of the ways that you sustain us and point us to Jesus and grow us in the life of Christ so that the wisdom of God and the love that we have come to know through you may enliven us and be made alive through us for the kingdom that God is making to come into this earth in Jesus' name. We pray for the ways that you have called us in the places where we work, in the homes where we live, in the schools where we study, and on the streets where we live. We pray God, for all of the ways that you are at work through your congregation and through your body to show yourself through all of these gifts and callings. We pray for teachers and professors and students this week as so many are preparing in our schools and universities to return to patterns of learning and gathering. And God, we pray that you would speak into it, that you would provide for needs that would hinder anyone from flourishing, that she would provide open doors and open minds and open hearts for friendships and relationships that will build people up and not tear them down. And we pray for each person that she would grow them in the ways that you are calling them. We pray for our congregation and for members of our church family who we long to lift up to you in your care and we pray for Tom Norman and Dennis Gebbin in the care of hospice. We pray for them, God, and for your presence with them, for your voice to speak to their hearts, and for your Holy Spirit to tend to their families and loved ones as they care for them and join them in these days. We lift up other brothers and sisters, God, Donna Prins and Barb Piaget, Phyllis Brown and Beth Dumay, Ruth Heideman and Paula Wilson. God, you know their needs. You know the longings of their spirit, and we pray for you to show your presence, to show your provision, and in every way to gather them. We pray for members of our church family at all kinds of stages of treatment or rehab or recovery or waiting. God, you know the prayer of every heart, and we lift these up to you together in Jesus' name. We pray for our missionaries who we partner with in your world. We pray for Lynn Gon, and we pray for the classes and students that you have given to her, and that you would bless these children and the programs that, uh, that work together to give knowledge, and most of all, God, for a vision of your love and your call for each one of the children there. We pray for Lubna Yunus, and we pray for the seminary where you have given her to work, and for local churches and believing community in Karachi, and we pray that you would bless them in all of the ways that they look to you, that you would shine through them in all of the ways that you are at work in their country, and that you would be glorified and that Jesus' name would be lifted high. We pray for Kids Hope, we pray for this program and these friendships and mentoring relationships in the school uh, that we partner with and across our city. We pray for renewed relationships and new friendships. Pray that you would bless each student this year with learning and growing that will set them up for life. And we pray that you would bless mentors with gifts of wisdom and friendship and guidance to offer. 
We pray for Samuel and Sani Lopez and Frontera de Gracia in Juarez. We pray for strength and energy and wisdom as they serve so many people who have fled and journeyed through pain and despair. We pray that you would bless each guest and migrant who comes to the shelter to renew in them or ignite in them the sureness of your love for them and bless them in all of the ways that they look to you. God, we lift up to you your church around this whole world across the globe. We pray that you would give your church wisdom from you, that you would give us compassion for the world that comes from you. We pray that you would shape and change our hope of flourishing to be caught up only in you. And God, that you would make us to hope for the flourishing of our neighbor and the stranger across the globe who was also made by you and for you. We pray, God, that you would grant us eyes to look for how you are calling all of creation back to you. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Third Reformed Church, go from this place and live the wise life the Lord God has invited you to live, being a fragrant offering of the coming kingdom that is now and not yet. And may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and bless and keep you now and until we meet again. Amen.